I call responding to summons. You see, when God teaches you the technology of burdens, burdens bring you into intimacy. Burdens activate consecration. The voice of God gives you direction. The voice of God gives you security. The voice of God gives you empowerment. But there is yet another thing. They are the summons of the Holy Spirit. From time to time, the Lord will bring you up for fresh instruction because things can change. The devil too re-strategizes. So Moses did not stop at the level of burdens. Moses traveled further to the level of hearing the voice and he yet traveled further to the level of summons. You read the Bible once and again and you hear the Lord say, Come up to the mountain, thou and Aaron. Come up to the mountain. Come up to the mountain. Exodus 19.22 Exodus 19.24 Come up to the mountain, thou and Aaron. It was the lifestyle of Moses. There were times when Moses came down. As he was just coming down, God calls him back. And then he will go back to the mountain. There were times when Moses didn't eat for 40 days. God said, come up. Come up. Come up. How often do you respond to summons? You sense a need for prayer. And I say, okay, I'll pray tomorrow. By God's grace. And tomorrow you wake up with another responsibility. And in the evening, that thing pricks you. The Holy Ghost pricks your heart. I you say, God, I forget to pray today. Tomorrow I'm going nowhere. And then your phone is on. WhatsApp chat. Bang, bang, bang. Why? Oh, wait till this person to talk like this. Facebook. King, king, king. Or oh, your auntie calls. Okay, are they come now? Are they come? Um, I'll come back by 12. <laughs> you will not go anywhere. See, most of the things I'm telling you like this, I learned them by experience. Nobody taught me. <laughs> God appeared to me when I was seven. By an open vision. But he amounted to nothing. If you don't do these things, you will go nowhere. I know people who pride themselves in, I've seen an angel, I've seen this. Keep saying what you are saying. After 10 years, we'll know those who are called. Ah, the Lord appeared to me. Ah, I saw Jesus. He walked through the wall and he was shining. His face was like the sun. Don't worry. When all of us become 50 years, we will look back and find out those who walked with God. <laughs> the elders did not pride themselves in their visions. The Bible says they walked with God. They walked with God. The things that make you are not your visions. It is your walk with God. As important as encounters are, if you don't subscribe to the protocols that they regulate you with, you will amount to nothing. He said they walked with God. One of the most, most, the man that explored the spirit realm the most was Enoch. But his greatest credential was not his visions. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. You know what it means to walk with God? Walking with God is what's the greatest issue it's like becoming a puppet in the hands of God if God wants to stretch his hand you are the one go to Boko go to Medugri don't sleep this night don't drink water do it that's what it means to walk with God walking with God is functioning always by his instructions you are exposed to his instruction and you are constantly yielded to it you will not have a life a man who walks with God lives no life is robbed of his own life that was the kind of life Jesus lived. He said, it is written in the volumes of the book. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7. I come to do thy will, O God. Even when it was difficult in Gethsemane, he knelt down and said, Lord, not my will, but thine. That's what it means to walk with God. Always sacrificing your own desire for the desire of the Father to find expression through you. There are few Christians that walk with God. Summons to the Spirit. Rise up. How many times do you respond when he taps you at night? Rather, you want to run and tell people ah, that last week an angel tapped me on the shoulder. An angel tapped me. <laughs> the carnality is just too much. While I was praying in the spirit, I saw light. What did you do? We will not hear that part. All your days of disobedience, we will not hear. I saw this. God spoke to me. But our lives are going nowhere. 
summons. This is how the Holy Ghost makes men and bring them into the fullness of their call. He begins by furnishing a burden in their heart. As they attend to that burden, they begin to access his voice. And then he gives them the instructions of destiny. But once and again, he will call them back to the mount. The life of Jesus was a mystery. It was a strange life. Jesus will go for a crusade, minister on the first day, and then the crowd will come the next day waiting for him. That's the day to shine. And then he will sneak through the back door and go to the wilderness or to the top of the mountain to pray. He never joked when the father summoned him. There were times when Jesus was going on the mission. And then while the disciples enter the boat, they are about to take off. You are about to enter your flight and then there is a summon. And then he will tell them to go, he's coming. And then he will go to the mountain. There are summons. These are the things that make men in the kingdom. Forget the company. Let them go. Follow God. That's what will make you. In this kingdom, only God makes men. In this kingdom. Forget the gimmicks. Forget the strategy. It doesn't work. Because when God is making a man, he first of all transforms him from the inside before he gives him authority and position. You can use strategy to pursue position. But even when you get it, you will make a mess out of yourself because at that point, your greatest weaknesses will be revealed. But when God makes you, he transforms you from the inside. You become a candidate and a recipient of his glory. A reflection of his dimensions. So even when there is no position, you enter a desert and a wilderness, it will become a forest. John went to stay in the wilderness. The Bible said in Luke chapter 1 verse 80 that he was there until the day of his showing forth. He didn't come back to the synagogue and say, I want to preach a sermon. While he was in the wilderness, the Bible said the whole of Judea went to him. He didn't need a pulpit. He didn't need a platform. All he needed was obedience to God. You can be in the wilderness and cry and God will amplify your voice by a mystery. And men will look for you and trace you into the wilderness. The places where our fathers have built their, their churches today, they were not lucrative places. When Bishop Oedeko entered into the wood, it was a forest. There were lands rejected. This man entered there. And today those lands are cities. Because they knew the voice of God. They knew how to trade with spirit. The ways of spirit are rare. And only men of obedience will be willing to follow. Because most of the times, it doesn't suggest any kind of advantage. Everything that constitutes an advantage, God will pull you out of it. Then he will teach you how to trust him. And it's that trust that will become your heaviest molecule as you walk with God. Because a day will come when you will stand in a land that is full of darkness. All you will hear is a whisper from heaven. And he will say, stretch forth your hand. How do you explain a man walking with over 3 million people? And he approaches a red sea. It was the spirit of God that led them in that direction. And then you come before the biggest obstacle. Nobody had ever crossed the Red Sea before. The technology of ships were not there. And it says, stretch forth thy hand. How can you ferry three million people beyond the Red Sea? There was an army chasing them behind. He says, stretch forth thy hand. Stretch forth thy rod. And the sea parted. And the Bible said, the glory of God left from the front and went to the back. And it caused the wheels of the Egyptian not to move. Many things happening at the same time because somebody has mastered how to hear the voice of God. How does the glory of God become an impediment to the wheel of chariots and horses? It's a wisdom in God, but it's only available to men of obedience. You are living with challenges, sickness in your body, house rent not paid, you are not married, you are 35. What do you need? It's the voice of God. When God speaks, one man can come into your life, he will buy you a house. House rent will no longer be a problem. He will solve the problem of marriage. And he can come as a man who is a prophet. And your infirmities will go away. It takes the voice of God. It's the most prized commodity in all of eternity. But very few have it. And that's why our world is laden with contradiction. The reason Satan and demons can deceive you is because you don't know the voice of God. If you know the voice of God, Satan will flee from you. Because all his strategy will become a waste. But there are few that know the voice of God. It takes a lot of dealing with God to come to that point. You must learn the way of bodies. He will furnish it at the weakest time of your life. Most times it comes when you are weak. Why do you think God does that? 
He wants to show you that there's another form of strength beyond the ones that food can provide your body. There's an energy that is beyond adenosine triphosphate. That one perishes, but the energy that comes from God, it does not deplete. It is the nature of the I am that I am. The El Shaddai dimension of God is what he wants to show you. That is when you can travel beyond the spheres of mortality and come into the chambers of immortality. You can draw from the strength that never runs dry because you learn to obey the voice of God. I was teaching them in the Bible school. We had had lecture for close to seven hours. They were tired. I told them, don't worry. There's another energy level. If we can get there, if we can get there, and when we travel to that energy level, they prayed in tongue for over three hours. And the more they prayed, the more they became stronger. It's a wisdom in God. How often do you attend to bodies? How often do you attend to the summons of God? That is what we make you. I don't talk against the ministry of prophets. God put them in the body for a very strategic purpose. It is prophets that bring to bear the laws of righteousness. It is prophets that give direction often times to the body of Christ. We don't talk against them. But the ministry of the prophet is not to make babes out of you. You must, of necessity, take the responsibility of alignment. Most of us here today, if I make another call for bodies, you'll be shocked. Everybody will come out. Bodies, bodies. There were times when the Holy Ghost came, troubling me in 2012. He said, pray, pray, pray. Every night, pray, pray, pray. A whole month will pass. I'll be planning to pray. I was not wise. Pray, pray. Most of the times, that is when your window is open. Your Kairos time has come. Heaven has moved on your account. But you are not wise. Pray. There was a time when God troubled me for three months to pray. I didn't pray once. In 2009, I didn't pray once. When that window closed, I now met somebody. And he was telling me how that three months ago, there was a wind of prayer. Ah. I said, wait, did God tell you two to pray? Ah. He said, they've been praying for the past three. Jesus. That was when I started trying to pray. The window has closed. The reason we stay in one spot for too long is because we don't know how to align with God. It's the way of the fathers. They understood the language of bodies. They understood the language of summons. And they had the word of God, the voice of God in their, at their disposal. Spirituality begins when you know how to walk with the spirit. It's not a function of God. It doesn't matter if you are born in church or you are a child of a pastor. What is your work with God? Your work with God is not the much scriptures you know and can quote. How much of God is walked into your vessel? And most times when the spirit wants to walk himself into you, he sucks you into his atmosphere. He draws you away from everybody so that you can mingle with him. The word is called koinonia. You participate with him. You experience him in communion. The mystery of communion is to show you the technology of oneness. In theology we call it the doctrine of interpenetration. Two becomes one. It's a mystery. It's what the whole infrastructure called marriage was set in place to mirror. To show you that it's possible for two to become one. And every time two becomes one, something is born. That is why marriage gives birth to children. It's a sign in the spirit. That every time you become one with the Holy Ghost, something will be born. And most of the time, it's your ordination that is born. You are a prophet, but it will never manifest in time. Unless you become one with the Holy Ghost. The same way a man and a woman becomes one and a child is born. That is how you become one with God and your destiny begins to blossom. Your ordination comes alive. Everything God wrote concerning you before the foundations of the world. The basis of their manifestation is your oneness with the Holy Ghost. But very few are one with God. Very few are one with God. Tonight we will cry. Lord, give me body. Give me hunger. I'm willing. I am willing. Most of us have aborted many heavenly missions. An angel entered your room and charged the room with energy. Every time you enter that room, you want to pray. It's as if worship songs begin to rise in your spirit. They are the sounds coming from heaven. But you have aborted mission too many times. Most of the times, even God himself stretches his hand in our direction. But we are bought mission. We are bought mission. Because we live for ourselves. Our life is characterized by too many... Too many distractions. And 
that is why we look for God. Whereas God is at the door of your heart, knocking everything. It comes in form of bodies. Bodies, bodies, prayer, fasting, giving. But never, we never attend to those voices. You want to cry? Say, Lord, tonight, show me the way of the Spirit. Show me the way of the Spirit. That I may.